All right. Joining you for another self-publishing podcast. Um, sort of, I've got, I, I actually made this reference before and Sean didn't know what it was, or he did, but then he was like, ha ha, I don't really do that. Um, I said, I, I feel like I have kind of senioritis today because this is like five days before Christmas or a week before Christmas when we're recording. I don't know why I bother doing that because it just sort of dates us. Comes when you listen to this in like the end of January and be like, it's not Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's All right, always, that it's always Christmas. We got Snoopy, Santa Snoopy in the background. Yeah. You know what? You should have a um, uh, little. What's his name? Is it Opie? No. What is it? Opus. Opus. There you go. You should have uh, Opus too. Doing something into Snoopy's mouth right there. Oh. Wow. <laughs> really? You're starting the show that way, Sean? Really? <laughs> hey, I didn't spend my childhood drawing such shenanigans. No, just your adulthood. <laughs> I I'm not the one who draws dirty pictures. That's Dave. Um, no, no, it's you not. Write dirty picture. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm very wow. excited because I was I was doing I was communicating a little bit. <laughs> when I say communicating, I mean saying things, and we'll see if they get um, received to Audra about um, Very Davy Christmas making its return appearance on the worst show ever feed, and um, I'm very excited about that so if you haven't had a chance we're D Dave and I were saying wouldn't it be fun to you know get people to reflect on what the very Davy Christmas has meant to them and do like a masterpiece <laughs> style. Uh, yeah. I would love that yeah I remember ask. where I was when I first heard a very Davy Christmas a very Davy Christmas is, is getting a lot of play too because it was also in the, the the worst show ever you know the worst of the the collection at the beginning. You know, Dave, for your love of the English accent, you may be the worst at it I've heard. <laughs> no, I, I can be good at it. Okay. Let's hear it. We want to hear it now. No, not now. I'm not your dancing monkey. <laughs> <laughs> so today's uh, guest is going to be Derek Webb from Noise Trade, which is a service where, um, well, I mean, we'll talk to him about it, but basically you can grow your email list while publicizing your books. Um, so that'll be cool. We'll have him on a bit in a bit. Before we have him on, I want to mention prominently that we... Um, uh, the Smarter Artist Summit is in full swing as far as um, being available. Like that was the worst constructed sentence ever, but it is. <laughs> it is um, because we've been trying to get that site up. It's it's smarterartistsummit.com. There's only 150 seats. It's just not. Uh, it's just not a concert hall. So if you want to get in on that, we wanted to get that up. Um, for no. us, it's before Christmas, but for you, it should be in time. What? There were 200 seats, but my butt takes up 50 of them. So. <laughs> well, the funny thing is that that's I, you're joking, but there are 200 <laughs> seats, and we basically have a lot of them already spoken for. So it's you could kind of make that argument. Okay. Uh, but there's only 150 for sale. So smarterartistsummit.com. We have the. Um, you you can tell the truth. Forty they, of them. Are, Forty of them are allotted for my bodyguards. <laughs> Dave in the Pope Mobile. Yes, Dave will be attending the Smarter Artist Summit. We're gonna try and get him a Pope Mobile. I think uh, people still don't believe that. That's, I, I think, <laughs> actually, and, and by people I mean me. I think that. I think that Dave's gonna, gonna be, attend. No, it's gonna be like March twentieth, and Dave's gonna send an email. I can't do it, man. I just, I just can't do it. <laughs> Dave, is there at least a chance that's gonna happen? I hope to God not. No, so, no. So there should be no chance of that. I, I will be driving. Uh, yeah. So will you please be live tweet that? Will you live tweet? Because you wouldn't live tweet the drive last time. Well, I didn't have a, a phone that was capable of doing that. So. I, I think the world missed out on your adventures, and it, so uh, uh, I know I've been promising to send you an iPhone for like a long time now. So if I do that, will you promise to live tweet it every time? Well, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that needs to happen. So. Um, it's smarterartistsummit.com. It's going to be the three of us, and then we have seven other official speakers, and we may or may not have special guests. So Joanna Penn's going to be there. Um, J.A. Huss, Julie Huss, she was actually on the last SPP, is going to be there. Nick Stevenson, um, Andre Chaperone, who is uh, the author of uh, Sean and My Song, our song, Autoresponder Madness, which is, you know, um, he's going to be talking about email marketing and autoresponders. He's the best email guy in the world, in our opinion. Um, Julia Kent, we've had her on the show. She's a best-selling uh, romance author. Mark from Kobo, Mark Lefebvre, and uh, James Tun from Podium uh, Audiobooks is going to be there. And maybe some other special guests. So, good stuff. 
who has something cool? Um, I have something cool, but I just went. Do you guys? I mean, I just bunch. So you guys want to do yours? Um, yeah, I have, I have, I have something. Let me think. Do you want something? Uh, do, do you want a money thing or a book thing? A book recommendation? Well, I'm going to do a book, so why don't you do money? Um, all right. So I, I don't know. Have you ever heard of Mint.com by chance or the, the app? No. It's just it's a it's a thing that uh, I I first started to um, to do this. I want to say like 2008, and then money just came like crashing down, and it was terrible, and I was sad. <laughs> I was losing my house, and so I didn't do it. Um, and I wanted to get it going before the end of the year um, for next year, and I and I started, and it's really cool. It's like a you know we, how we talked about the amazing universal dashboard that would change the world if we had like one dashboard where you know Amazon and Kobo and Apple and everything was in one place and we can navigate it. So this is like that, um, but for your money. So you can put all your credit cards in there and your debt and um, you know any assets that you have as far as cars or real estate or whatever, um, you know, along with your bank accounts. And then it just kind of gives you a, a broad view of it. And I'm really excited that I actually have everything in there. And if you're running like a small business, you know, which every writer is, right? You're, you've got kind of a small business there. It's really cool to, um, to uh, uh, get kind of a, a bird's eye view of everything you have, everything that's coming, everything that's going. And the software also does really cool stuff where um, uh, it, it gives you recommendations, you know, like, okay, well, clearly you're spending too much money in this category. Your groceries were 130% this month. So it's, it just helps you kind of track your finances. And, and I like that. I think it's really smart. And it's a free service. Um, they make their money by, you know, basically suggesting things like, hey, open up a low-interest account here, stuff that, like that. Um, but it's, it's cool. It's a very cool service. And I'm happy to be able to see um, all my financial stuff in one place for the first time. Do you have anything, Dave? Something cool? Yes. Yes, I do. Fargo, season two. I didn't watch season one of Fargo. Uh, season two is a separate story, and I started watching it, and oh my my, it, it is such a well-written show. It reminds me a bit of Tarantino. I think you'd like it a lot, Sean. It's awesome. You know, I watched the first season, and I just I found it a little slow. Whoa, and watch season two. I, I mean, I will because it's a it's a totally separate um it's a totally separate thing. Uh, so maybe 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 I'll dig it. Um, and that makes it easy. You know, if I whatever but but the first the first season and I know the first season's good like I didn't question its quality and I thought Billy Bob Thornton was awesome in it but I don't know I just I felt like the the episodes were really long they were an hour well I know <laughs> I know but like Boardwalk Empire which I'm watching right now I'm almost yes. done I'll be done by the next time we record um and I, I those are an hour those are like 57 minutes and they fly by. Like when they're done, I'm like, oh, I kind of want another one. But Fargo, I was always, okay, is this going to end soon? Season two is much uh, better paced. Uh, th there, there is that slow burn, but the characters are so good. You don't care because you're, you're getting to know them and their eccentricities. I think you'll really like uh, the dialogue in this one too. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll officially check it out. You hear that? Officially. Officially check it out. Um, <laughs> mine is a book, so um, this a is... A what? A book. There's some books? Wow. It's actually something that I've read. Uh, I read it back in college, and I decided, since I've been reading in the mornings, like I actually burn through books at a decent clip now. You really and shouldn't burn books, Johnny. I know. Well, it's... No, I could have made a joke that would have probably been tasteless, so I won't. Um... <laughs> But it's, uh, an anyway, so I'm, I'm rereading Catch-22, and I'm noticing several things about it. First of all, um, if the anybody has read that, well, it, it's, it's, um, the satire is, is amazing. Like, the, um, one of the things that I really like about use of humor is when it can disarm. And, first of all, Catch-22 is just really fucking funny. For, like, 90% of the book is just really, really funny. If you like that kind of humor, it's just kind of absurd and ridiculous. And, um, but but the ten percent that isn't funny is extra effective because the rest is just so so strange. So have so you crazy. read Catch Twenty Two, Dave? I got to the wedding scene. 
<laughs> no, no. Actually, I have the book, and I started it like four different times, and I know it's going to be awesome. And then I, I put it aside. I think because I have it in um, trade paperback, and mm -hmm. I don't like to carry a book around anymore since I have the Kindle. Yeah, I actually have the Kindle version, and I'm, I'm about halfway through it now. But, um, you know, my, my I mean, just to give you an idea, like if you haven't read it, um, one of my favorite character chapters, it's by character, and I think I drew from this for the Bialy Pimps without even really realizing it, is um, there's a character named Chief White Halfout who's um, Native American, and his, his family that is like... That was my stripper name. His family is like divining rods for oil. I was so full out. His backstory is that he every time his family moves somewhere, they discover oil and kick him off their land. And <laughs> But then the, the people just started following him around because wherever they sat down, they discovered oil. Um, just shit like that. But but then the other thing is that what Sean mentioned is now that I'm a, I'm writing like, motherfucker uses a lot of adjectives, a lot, a lot, a lot of adjectives, and it's in the, it's in the he said she said sort of stuff. It's in um, the description. It's just constant with the adverbs and adverbial phrases and describing exactly how things are said and done. But um, I notice it. But whatever, like it's just part of Heller's voice. So there you go. Anyway, so Catch-22, good stuff. So, um, you know, I, I know that our guest coming on for Noise Trade, um, I'm trying to think of a way to ask my question that, of course, is on the tip of my tongue, is... Um, hey, you could parlay uh, Catch-22 into this somehow. Okay. So forget what I was going to say about <laughs> Noise Trade. And when I think of a Catch-22, of course, that's an unwinnable situation. And what is an unwinnable situation... Other than what can I possibly, who can I get to do my book cover? Like, how can I get a good book cover? And the answer is, you can't, because the minute you try to do a good book cover, you end up with a shitty one, and there's nothing. Maybe we'll just do. give up. Is that you what you're saying? We'll just give up. Mm -hmm. No, no. And you know what? This is a a, a beautiful thing um, about this time of season, Christmas miracle, if you will. The good folks at 99designs.com slash SPP are there to save you. They are there to provide a miracle of a book cover for you. Uh, a beautiful a baby Jesus. A, a beautiful cover. baby Jesus, if you will, of book covers. If you want a great book cover, you don't have to do your own book cover. You don't have to have a crappy book cover. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Yes, well, yes it is. It, it is, and, and I'm very excited that it's only a week before Christmas, and I'm feeling the brotherhood of, of man, basically, when you're talking about the miracle that is a book cover. Yes, and we have used them several times, and tons of our listeners have been using them. Otherwise, they wouldn't advertise with us because it's not for our great ad reads. Well, clearly, and that was actually <laughs> the most recent one. We're well, not the most recent one where Sean and I tried to wing it without you, and we didn't know oh. what to do. So at the end, we just said, "Yeah, they're great. Murder, suicide, ayahuasca." <laughs> There's just a litany of things that you can, you know, that everybody thinks of, of course. So yeah, clearly that's working against us. So they must have a good. It's like uh, with a name like Smuckers, it has to be good. With they're so rate, good. If they're, they're still using us, yeah, and we're still. They're so good that the the ads are succeeding in spite of us, and that's because they offer a great service where you come, you you go to 99designs.com/spp. And you, you tell the designers what book cover you want. Maybe you give them some examples. Maybe, uh, you know, you show them, you know, other covers that you like or whatever. You, you just, you tell them what you want and they're going to come up with something that you're going to love. And there's going to be a lot of something, some things that you love. You're going to have too many book covers to choose from. It's a quality problem. And the best thing about it is you can use it in your promotion when you're, when you're uh, telling people about your book. What better way than to get them involved in helping to choose a book cover, or at least you know, you know, run a poll and let them get involved in some way, and that gets people more excited about the book cover rather than oh yeah, I just did this book and here it is. Get them involved, show them the process, and it, you're going to have a great book cover, guaranteed. So start your custom design today at 99designs.com slash spp, and if you use that link, you get the free power pack upgrade valued at 99 bucks. And um, let's face it, if you aren't using that link, then, you know, no, no presents for you because you're just not doing anything right. Um, you're the Grinch if you're not. You are the Grinch if you do that. So, um, so, so Dave, when you were doing, um, when you were dressing up Snoopy and, and Opus back there, 
Did you um did you think of our military podcast guests and what they would think if they came on to see you dressing up your stuffed animals instead of just having them in the background? It's not dressed up. I bought that Snoopy for my wife at a card shop when when to we were fair, dating. To be fair, Opus is dressed up. No, no. Oh, that he's not. Comes That's a like separate. That. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So don't don't make fun of my toys. <laughs> I have some toys. <laughs> I don't. I have a sad, lonely yeah. <laughs> so do you guys want to talk about Star Wars, Star Wars while we're waiting for our guest? Uh, I think that's a topic that we're going to broach, and then immediately we're going to have our I guest. I didn't think we were going to talk about that on Worst Show Ever, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Oh, oh my kids, uh, we were talking about that today, and they were asking which ones I've seen, and I think we're going to watch them all, despite watch Dave's them? wife's objections. Are you going to watch them chronologically, or...? I think we watch them the way that um, God intended. Yeah, I think we start with with uh, you know episode four, work, yes. episode four, yeah, for sure. All right, well, I see uh, Derek popping in. I'm still waiting for video and audio, but I do see him joining us. Hello, hi, Derek. Hey, I hear you, Derek. Derek. You guys hear me okay? Yes, we hear you now. We see you. Oh, good. Should I put yes. on some headphones and be cool like you guys? Yes, you should. Otherwise, the audio will bounce back. We don't do it to look cool. That's just a side effect. I mean, <laughs> all right, awesome. Cool. Yeah, you guys look cool. Yeah, to be Especially fair, you look cooler than us. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, do you want to sort of take the lead because we, we, in our interactions with Noise Trade, it, it was yesterday's gone season one that we did a lot of stuff for, and I believe you sort of headed that up. Do you? So, do you want to? Yeah, De Derek is a musician, longtime musician who uh, started Noise Trade. Uh, basically to help musicians uh, market and get their music out there and build their email list and sell directly to the customer or give it away for free. Uh, why don't you tell us about h how that came to be, why you did it in the first place, and then you know why you went into uh, books with authors. Yes. Yeah, well, man, it's a pleasure to, to join you guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, so the way that Noise Trade started, so, yeah, I'm a 20-year blue-collar musician, um, you know, my whole adult life. Um, I've, I've played music for my job, and uh, m probably almost none of the people watching this have ever heard of me, which, uh, which is kind of a testament, you know, to, uh, to a good career because I've managed to make a good living at it under the radar, and I think that's a, that's a bl – blue-collar is a good way to go when you're dealing in the arts. keeps you honest. And um, and so I, I was. Uh, it was about ten, uh, almost ten years ago. I put my third record out, and um, and my I, I'm the kind of I've always been the kind of artist that has a really small but really kind of active little tribe of folks who have been very supportive. And um, and my people had bought the record, so we kind of sold what we were going to sell. Um, I was on a major label at the time. The the uh, marketing money was spent um, to promote the record. And so the label, about six months into the cycle, kind of came to me and said, uh, let's start talking about the next record. We need to kind of move on. And I said to them, um, just on this one particular record, for some reason, I, you know, I felt I had a little more ambition about people hearing this record. I said to them, you know, I think there are a lot of people who would resonate with and like this record who just haven't heard it. Like, our marketing dollars are not finding them. And, um, and I would like to keep working on this record if we can. And they said to me, I think rhetorically, uh, unless you can come up with a way that we can promote the record further that doesn't cost us any money, we have to move on, you know. And but I, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a, a thinker type, and so I said, okay, well, give me a minute, let me think about that. And so this was 2006, um, almost 10 years ago. And so I came back to them with the idea of them letting me give away the record for free digitally for three months. Um, and every download we gave away, we would get an email and a zip code. So like geo-targeted email list, it was what we would wind up with. And I thought we could probably make the same, if not more, money um, being able to target both geographically when I'm playing shows or traveling or doing any kind of things you know, regionally, uh, or just having a, 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 the business that iTunes or Amazon or these people are in. They're in the customer acquisition business. And why would I, as the content creator, not want to own my own list of customers. I mean, not to be crude about it, but at the end of the day, this is what I do for a living, and um, mm -hmm. I would rather be able to go direct. I can charge less and make more going direct to my uh, to my people. So um, we were able to kind of convince them of this. They let me give the record away 
for free for those three months. Was that a hard conversation? Was there friction, or did they get it after like a little bit of explanation? Yeah, I think that we um, they were a little bewildered at first because you know, you know this was 2006, you know, so it was it was ludicrous to give away content. Um, we invest a, all this money in you, and you just want to give yeah, it away. Yeah, well, well, especially as a strategy to make money. They just they didn't quite, you know, like record labels, unfortunately, were slow to the adaptation uh, that came after the disruption in our business. And, like uh, publishing houses. That's, well, so we'll get to that in a minute. And so, um, and so but they did let me do it. Um, and uh, and it it just it, it was it blew everyone's minds. We we couldn't have anticipated how well it was going to go. I, I managed to give away like eighty five thousand digital downloads of this record in three months, and suddenly I'm sitting on a giant database of new fans, um, many of whom had never heard of me previous, That's all awesome. of whom had never paid me a dime. You know what I'm saying? And so at a time when piracy was at all time high and the you know, the FBI is chasing down grandmothers and little kids for piracy. <laughs> Here I am, you know, I'm the copyright owner. So I have the right to give it to them, and it's legal, you know. And um, so, um, but but that actually, to wrap up the story, is not actually where Noise Trade was born. All we'd managed to do at that point was give away a bunch of records, you know, and lose a bunch of money, essentially, you know, as far as anyone was concerned on the business side. But here's where Noise Trade was born. So the first thing, my thinking is, anybody who downloads this record and hates it and deletes it, well, there's a zero opportunity cost because I never would have gotten their money. I'm not looking for my not fans. I'm looking for my fans. Right. So the people who get it and hate it, well, I didn't lose anything on those people. I was never going to get their money. But the people who got it and loved it, and that was the only way by which they were going to discover me, well, here's just a whole new sandbox for me to get into. And so the first thing I wanted to know was where are these people and who are they? So I, something fascinating I learned. So when we filtered that list by zip code, the, the, uh, in, the, in the five cities where I had given away the most records, two of those cities I'd never once played a show in. Um, it was New York and Los Angeles because I'm like a niche folk singer. I don't have any business going to New York and L.A. trying to make any money because it's too competitive. But here's this data that tells me I've got this huge concentration of fans in these two cities. And so I called my agent and I said, I, we're going to run an experiment. Um, we need to find out if this is actually a business model that we could replicate, something a way we can make money. So we said, can if you guys could book me any show on any night in any venue for any pay in Los Angeles, I'll take anything. I'll take a bank opening. I mean, give me anything. <laughs> and um, would so you have they, actually taken a bank opening? Well, probably, well, probably, well, maybe, probably not. But uh, and so and so they did. They got me a Wednesday night. Horrible. Um, at the Knitting Factory on Hollywood Boulevard and in the smallest downstairs bar room, holds about 100 people, for a zero guarantee, but 90% of the door. So if nobody shows up, it's on me. But if people do show up, then it's on me, right? I, you know, I make some money. So I took it, and then here's what we did. So two weeks before that show, we geo-targeted within 20 miles of downtown LA where that venue sits. I think it was about 2,200 people had downloaded my record, I mean, out of 85,000. Uh, 2,200 people within 20 miles. So we emailed those people, said, hey, please come out to the show, you know, whatever it was, 10 bucks at the door. Um, two days before the show, we hit them again. Hey, hope you love the record. Please come out. I'm going to be right in your town, 10 bucks at the door. No idea what was going to happen. So my friends and I, uh, my friend and I who, who lives in L.A., we, we uh, were walking up to the, to the club and no idea what was going to happen. And uh, the thing you got to know about the knitting factory is I'm in this small downstairs bar, 100 people, but there's two bigger rooms. So the middle-sized room is like maybe 350 people. The big room is like thousands. It's like where big artists play. So we're walking up, and there's like a line down Hollywood Boulevard to get into the knitting factory. And my buddy and I are thinking like, man, I wonder who's playing in the big room. Maybe we'll sneak into that show after I'm done, you know? <laughs> and we get up there, and all those people are there to see my show. Hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. And um, and the knitting factory is looking at me like, who the hell are you? You know, and I'm like, I'm nobody. You know, and that's why this this matters. This means something. We did. We pulled something up. We did this with data. This wasn't a lightning strike. We did this intentionally. Um, sold the show out. Made great money. Turned away twice the capacity of the room. Went outside on the curb and played a second show for the people who couldn't get in. You know, and wow. they booked me that night to come back six months later for a guarantee, which I did, and sold it out six months later. Did the same thing in New York at the bitter end. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, I'm playing in all the wrong cities. Why am I going to Cincinnati and playing for 10 people in a room that holds 100 when I could go to L.A. 
and play for 200 people in a room that holds 100. Like I need to, all of a sudden it just demystified it. And that's what lit the fuse on me and a few friends of mine um, starting Noise Trade because, you know, I just thought I've got so many friends. I live in Nashville. I've got so many friends in this town who I know would be more than willing to give away a little content in exchange for information with which they can make a living. I knew they would do it, but 2006, it was a ludicrous idea. It took us two years to bring it, uh, to do it, so in 2008, we launched Noise Trade, which helps artists do exactly what I did, uh, you know. So how does it change, or does it change, if you take the geo, you know, the, the geographical component out of it? So if you're an artist who isn't necessarily going to tour, or if you're um, writers like us, like we, we may go do book signings or something, but in general, we aren't going to, um, you know, try to sell at events. So how does it change in those scenarios? Well, I think that you you definitely want to have that. I think that, you know, um, the obviously email every single year, countless articles come out about how email's dead. Um, and and but that's like saying that the, the telephone is dead. Of course it is. But but is it really? I have one. I have one right here on me. I never go anywhere without it. So it's iterated, it's changed, it's evolved. The telephone is not dead. It's a primary way of communicating in West, you know, in modern culture. Inter you know, email, I don't know, man, it's linked to the to the life of the internet. And and email is still, believe it or not, over social media, over whatever is cool right now, is still the best way to actually make conversions and engage people to take action in anything. Um, and so email is essential. Zip codes, I think, are essential to get. Um, I think your question is more like, what if we can't really make use of them? You still want to have them, but there are so many ways to extract value out of an email list without having to use the, the geo kind of component, but even for an author or um, a, an artist who doesn't tour, there are a lot of interesting things you can learn um, having that geographical information. For instance, um, there are things that like that, that book sellers and even uh, uh, labels who uh, whose primary way of distribution used to be brick and mortar stores, right? So you would know how many records, how many books have I sold in a particular region or in a particular town or a particular store and that information kind of stops trickling in once you're distributing everything from a box up in the cloud somewhere that just replicates digital copies forever. You kind of start losing that, that regional data. And I think that you'd be surprised how many interesting ways, how many interesting things you could do with that. Um, so I think you always want to get it. Um, but uh, there are definitely a lot of ways, you know, a lot of artists don't tour. Um, there's a lot of ways to engage fans and even monetize data without having to tour. Um, but you want to get it. So, Derek, I don't. You don't need to convince us on the value of email lists or free. But um, just in the interest of the f full discussion, what what, um, what, do you, what do you see with people? Like, is there a trend toward people? Um, you know, I got the free seekers basically. Like, oh, I got something for free, and now season two of Yesterday's Gone is out, and I don't want to pay for that. Or, I mean, do you see mm -hmm. a difference there, or um, same as any email campaign? I mean. I think it's a thing you, that you kind of, it's, it's kind of like reading the tea leaves a little bit in terms of how, how people's behaviors are evolving, but, but like in my opinion, like when I talk to uh, um, independent author, friends of mine, writers, independent artists, musicians, um, everybody seems to, the, the problem people seem to have or the, or the challenge is like there's just so much since the, um, the gates of distribution have been disrupted and are now down and out of the way, and, and the market is just available for anyone now to go and distribute um, their works. Mm -hmm. Now, like where the problem used to be, um, you know, uh, scarcity. Now it's now it's ubiquity. It's like there's just so much everywhere. How do I get up over the noise of the market? You know, how do I get noticed? And I think that you, people's instinct tends to be to just to swing the bat as hard as you can and just aim for the back fence and try to get as many fans and readers. And I have actually found the opposite to be true. I, I think the antidote to um, all the noise in the market, in my opinion, is two, two rules I think applies to almost any professional creative person. And that is you cannot break rule number one, which is be great. Be great. Uh, you know, you're, I mean, you can learn how to shake all the hands and kiss all the babies and do social media, but if you're not producing great content and really working on your craft, those other things aren't going to sustain you for long. So be great, unfortunately, is rule number one. You can't break it. Rule number two, in my opinion, behind be great is aim small. Like focus on the tip of the spear, hardcore tribe. Like find those people who so love and deeply connect to and resonate with what you're doing and writing and making 
Um, it's what Kevin Kelly, uh, the editor, previous editor of Wired Magazine, uh, talked about almost, what, like 10 years ago or something when he wrote, or 2009, I don't remember what it was, he wrote this great article that I'm sure you guys are familiar with called uh, 1,000 True Fans. Mm -hmm. And he laid out this, this kind of manifesto about how if you have 1,000 true fans, and this scales, but it's a, that's kind of your baseline, 1,000 people who so love and resonate with what you're doing that they would give you $100 a year that, that, that they'll buy everything you do that they'll come to everything every online event every whatever you're doing they're going to consume 100% of it you can have a great middle class living as a creative professional for the rest of your life if you can focus on and find a thousand true fans and I think that aiming small and starting with super serving your hardcore fans those people who just so get what you're doing and then letting it scale and build out from there then you employ those people empower those people to be your marketing team and your evangelists um, let them convert their friends. That's a really smart way to build a career, in my opinion. So, so how does uh, Noise Trade help help people find those true fans? Like, let's let's say you write horror, for instance. You write yes. something like Stephen King. How how do you go into as an author? How how tell us how it works because we really haven't discussed that yet. How does yeah. it work? And how does an author find fans of Stephen King? Uh, I want those people to check out my book. Not everybody else. Not like Judy Blume right. fans. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So. I think, and the good thing is, is the challenges are really similar. Like um, for for uh, for independent author, for all independent creators. I mean, independent authors, independent musicians. It's a similar struggle. And there's a few ways. There's a few ways that we can specifically help at Noise Trade, and then there's a few ways that are just general rules of thumb. And the, here's the first thing I'll say. So I'm old enough um, to have been around and lived a lot of life pre-internet, you know. And uh, I remember what it was like. Um, when the dream as an independent uh, artist or creative person was if I could just get distribution, right? If I could just get my records in the stores, like on the shelves, and people could go into stores and actually find my records, that was the dream. And then little by little, as that started to open up before the internet kind of started and really took root, then you figure out, oh, wait, so now I've managed to go through some indie distribution avenue and I've got my records in stores. That actually isn't the hard part. The hard part is not how do I get my records on shelves, the hard part is how do I get my records off the shelves, you know? And and so when iTunes or when TuneCore and and uh, and a lot of the distribution channels that have opened up on the internet for for both books and and, uh, and music content, when that all started, that became the dream. Before TuneCore and things like that made it made it really easy, the uh, the dream was how do I get my records on iTunes? If I could just get my records on iTunes, boy, I'd have a career. And then you realize, oh wait, nope, the digital shelf is just like the analog shelf. It's like the hard part's getting it off. And the way you want to think about noise trade is the same way you think about any of these other things. It's a tool, it's a digital shelf to get your products on. Now people take them for free off our shelf, whereas they might pay, and there's a strategy to distributing them for free because they do, you did get their, their information, their data, and there, is, there are so many ways, uh, you know, data being an, uh, a reusable resource, um, you can make money, you can really build a career, there's a strategy there. But, um, but just getting it on noise trade is not necessarily going to solve that problem for you. Now we do try to help um, musicians and authors tag their stuff, you know, in such a way to where put in authors that uh, your readers may be fans of, and try to be realistic about that. You know, you may wish that your readers were uh, for you know readers of this great author, but really, you know, be smart um, about how you categorize yourself, and then we make that those things searchable, um, you know, so that folks can find you if they're looking. But the primary way by which we help is um, we have. We've spent years uh, curating a giant email list of folks who are looking to discover new book content, new music content, and they trust us um, because we really heavily curate. But we've got spots for folks at every different stage of their career. So we have like some primary things we feature. We send out about two or three emails a week, and, and there are about a million and a half people on that list who get these emails from us. Um, and so we've got kind of a primary feature and sometimes it's book, sometimes it's an album. We've got a secondary and we've got kind of new and notable emerging authors and artists who we feature um, and and we price those things um, for independent um, creative people. We're working really hard to take price tags off that altogether and and uh, and get that paid for another way so we can just offer that for free um, just for anybody we think is great that we want to get behind and we do a lot of that. If we find an author, we find a musician who we really believe in and love, we think are doing great things, We'll just pop them into our email just because we love it because we want to be part of the story too. Um, but 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 second to those things, that's kind of high and low, that middle ground. 
is look for other authors who are, and this is how I did it. When I was giving my record away, I didn't give 85,000 records away because I had 85,000 fans. I gave 85,000 records away because I worked really hard to go to my friends who were in bands who had bigger tribes than me who I thought might have fans who might be into my stuff and say, hey, would you please mention this for me? Would you please put this in front of your audience because I bet I've got a remnant of fans inside of your audience. I would love to convert them and get them into my audience, get permission from them to promote to them. And um, So I think that's a really good strategy too. You know, because it's like either we're all going to make it or none of us are going to make it. So it's, this is really the time to share your knowledge, be generous with what you know, the experiments you're trying, what's working, what's not. Talk to other independent authors and, and small publishers, artists even, uh, independent record labels. Let's all like share what we know and let's help each other build tribes and then let's figure out how we can all do that better. Um, and then when those, and if you're generous about that, if you're generous helping other people, telling your tribe about their thing, man, that comes back around and then you can go to them when you've got a, a strategic moment where you want to give something away to lead generate for a thing you want to release for sale next year. That's when you go to all your friends and all those blogs, all those people who you are generous with, ask them to be generous to mention your thing and that can convert a lot of people too. Now, what, what are some of the similarities you're finding uh, between marketing music and, and eBooks and what are some of the key differences that you're finding as you're doing this? <laughs> and what's the group size. I was actually going to ask that books versus music. Yeah. Well, um, you know, like uh, we, we're we trying so the, obviously the, our music uh, audience is, is bigger because we that's our, you know, we're musicians. We came to this trying to solve music problems um, and then did seize opportunities where we felt like we could be a useful tool to our our neighbors, our cousins in the, uh, in the, you know, in the uh, independent publishing community and, and uh, so, um, but we've been doing music longer, so, you know, our, our music list is, by itself, is well over a million, you know, um, but then the, the, the book portion of that list, the people who we can identify who've showed interest in and by their behavior and download behavior um, uh, who've been interested in, in books, I don't remember exactly where it is, but it's, it's, it's definitely in the, you know, 150, 200,000 range, but, but, but what we're trying to do is help convert and evolve that community of people into we want to we want to be thought of less as a music site and more of just a, a people who are just interested in great content um, and be it music or books and, and soon we're going to make uh, what we hope to be a meaningful move into film um, our model works with really any digital content it's a great model there's a real strategy in any kind of market we're looking for like who who, who are our neighbors who the disruption that hit us 10 years ago is going to hit is hitting now or is going to hit in the future? We can provide solutions. We hope for those people. So um, we're trying to evolve our whole audience into general content fans, and we have marketed uh, more than a handful of books aggressively to our audience, and they've done pretty well. And so, um, um, but yeah, there are challenges and differences. I think the main thing that we've come up against is in the way that the the music. Maybe because we're a little further into the the cycle of the disruption than the publishing world is, I, we see it trending about maybe five or six years behind in general. Now it's it, it's a, it's a really different type of market with a really different. A lot of things are super different, but there are some similarities. And the main struggle we're having is when we first launched Noise Trade Books. I don't remember how long ago it's been more than a year. Um, when we first launched it, we did some outreach to the publishers we thought would be forward thinking about it. Um, we definitely went in with our cautionary tale of don't wait as long as the labels waited um, for the for the the goal to come down the old mine shafts. It's never coming that way again. Now there's more there's more maybe even more money in the market, but it's just it's just like it's 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 fractured and it's it, it's just it's in different places. It's, it might feel like a trust fall to actually go and find it, but it, it is there. And and like the the business is maybe even bigger than the previous business, but it's a whole other, you gotta squint your eyes at it and it's gonna feel crazy for a minute, but once you make the transition, um, you're gonna make it. It, it. We're all gonna make it. It's just, it's gonna feel crazy for a minute. The music business eventually threw their hands up and said, okay, well, I don't think sending lawyers after our customers is probably a great investment into the future of our business. And, <laughs> that was a wise um, move on their part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah, that, that, that's, that's definitely the, the last grasp of the last few pennies you're ever going to make out of those people. No wonder if they had put their money and energy into technology those first few years rather than 
you know, lawyers going after like well, it's the I, difference between fear-based thinking and just being optimistic about that's the future. A, that's exactly right. Or, or or just treating it as an opportunity, not believing that, oh, we're the only industry that's ever been through this and woe is us. It's like every single industry in history goes through some cycle of disruption where something organic happens, a business forms out of that, it gets structured, then it gets inefficient. And then there's gaps, and then those gaps give opportunities for disruption. Disruption happens, it crumbles, then something organic happens, and it gets structured. It's a cycle that every industry goes through. It's the first time that the that the music business went through it, so we feel like it's never happened before. You know, we're artists, we're dramatic, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so um, but so far it feels like the publishing community, not the independent publishing community so much, but the broader major publishing community, which we did some uh, some pretty serious outreach to when we first launched the platform. Um, they have been pretty um, uh, resistant to <laughs> trying new things. You know what I'm saying? And, and we've tried to go to them and say, listen, like this is the moment right now to begin digging tunnels under Amazon. Like They are in the business of acquiring and monetizing your customers. Now, that might never change in terms of just their sheer you know, size or whatever, influence in the market, but you might be surprised – what a great and robust and lucrative business you could run just being able to go direct to a segment of that market because what you're selling to that segment is going to be so much different than what they're selling to the mass because um, if you're monetizing super fans again these are the people who want to give you they want to buy in at that hundred dollar level that five hundred dollar level that gets a private reading in their living room around the release of a new uh, novel or graphic novel or book or you know like the, there are people who really want to engage deeply and it's a whole different kind of economy you're dealing with and you can monetize a much smaller segment of the market and make the same if not more money so you really need to be getting into the customer acquisition business right now uh, and and to the to a large extent they just they kind of couldn't be persuaded they were like no nah, we're gonna double down on this and we said well, there's well, a big shock <laughs> yeah well and, and we were like you know like that's that's fine Here's 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 our email. In a couple years from now, you'll you'll be back. Um, it happened to the record labels. So we, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're happy. crawling on your knees. Well, and we'll be ready to help. You know, I mean, because we really want to help. You know, and so uh, so that's been the main difference. Is it, it seems like that publishers have been slower to the ad to adapting, maybe, um, you know, and and we and we a platform like ours, we hope to accelerate the adaptation. So that the fallout and the bloodbath is less than it was with what we saw, because it was brutal. It was brutal. Now, have you uh, have you gotten together with like any indie bookstores uh, to to kind of get this going? Because that seems like it would be a natural. Yes. Yeah, so there has been a little bit of outreach. It's been mostly kind of regional, and like, we've got a couple of great independent bookstores here in Nashville. Um, and you know, we it's it's hard because it's different because with um, on the music side. Because the content can be consumed in, in in a meaningful amount of content can be consumed in smaller pieces, like a song. Like you're mm -hmm. not really going to give away, you know, six paragraphs, or or have a <laughs> compilation book of a bunch of random chapters. You know, like it's harder to do. Whereas you can put together a compilation of songs that can begin to build a brand and a tribe for a distributor, um, and, and where they get a reputation. Um, and they can start to, to use that in, in interesting ways to try build on their own that they can bring to bear on individual artists or whatever. So, um, but, what, but that's one of the reasons why I think it is really important for independent authors especially to go ahead and get that, that geographic part of the data that Noise Trade will, will you know, make sure that you get um, geo-targeted emails because then you could, for instance, if there was a collection of authors who were all – um, really hustling and working hard and, and uh, working hard uh, on the data gathering side of, of their careers, they might find, wow, we all have um, a concentration of fans and readers in a, couple of, in a couple of regions. We ought to do something. We ought to go and maybe as a group contact whoever the big mom and pops are there and ask if they would let us do a one day like reading. We could, I mean, let's get crazy. Let's get creative. We could do like a one day festival where we all do readings and all gather bring some even stuff in on consignment that maybe leads us to some permanent distribution in some of those stores. And so there's a lot of ways uh, to use the, for, for authors to band together and, and definitely for Noitra to do that. And we're looking for ways all the time to do this, but to then go and be of support to uh, local bookstores to drive traffic in 
either with readings or events or cool things or promotion, even th for them to, to say, hey, um, we know we've, I know I've got a bunch of you guys who are concentrated in a particular city. Here are a list of the great mom and pop stores. I don't even have books there, but I'm going to have books there someday because I'm working hard and I think I'm good and you guys are with me. So let's be sure and support them from here to now and just drive traffic in. That would be such goodwill into the future of your business too. So I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I can see romance authors really taking advantage of that because they're already getting together and doing like box sets and hitting the New York Times bestseller list. Exactly. And, and they and they have like conferences and stuff. I could totally see romance yeah. authors. And those they seem readers to be the most organized. Yeah, they're organized yeah. and the readers are just, they devour. That's right. They're su that, that's right. They're really robust. And, and the thing is, I know it kind of sounds crazy now, but like here's the thing. What you have to remember is in the music business, you know, 10 years ago, there was, you know, in terms of the, how the sales curve works, there's like the big head of the sales curve. Then there's that really almost indiscernible tail behind it that was like you, you were basically either a professional, which means you had a record deal and songs on the radio, or you were a hobbyist. And there was no middle class. There was no access. There was no way to capture, record, distribute, promote, fund content unless you had a record deal. It was a really narrow way in to the market. Um, and now the entire business, like the head of the sales curve, which is basically occupied almost 100% by Taylor Swift, um, is like the anomaly. No one even, no one's even trying to swim up the stream into the head of the sales curve. Now there's this big thick tail of opportunity, and that's the entire market. That's our whole business now. Is the aggregate of of independent or blue collar level artists who are working hard, and that's the whole business, you know. And in and right now, I probably feels I don't know how it feels, but it probably feels a similar way that it used to be. The only art, uh, authors who were making a living were people who could get book deals and get advances and kind of get you know those kind of opportunities. But here's the thing: there is as we speak, the ground is shaking beneath our feet in a good way to give way to a space where authors are going to be able to have a very robust, independent career. There's the 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 middle class is now opening up. And you might find that there are these cr things that seem crazy now maybe, but might be really cool opportunities. We might get creative and have to get crazy, but where you really could a couple times a year go out on a circuit into independent stores, do readings, sell books on the spot, find ways to do to, to monetize an audience in crazy ways you might have even thought of. There might be music uh, lessons from the music business or other whole businesses we haven't even thought of of ways that you could have an a very lucrative independent uh, career as an author, completely yeah. subverting the, the publishing business that's, because, yeah. That's well underway. I mean, most, it is. It feels most, like of, it the is. most of the writers we know, uh, they're, they're either doing very well or they're like mid-list sort of level. But when you were mid-list with a publisher, you know, you weren't making a, a ton You're of money. You're on the way to being forgotten. They yeah, just, but, but that's right. Out. But now we're, we are going, even though you know we go through Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, all, Apple, all those places, we are still kind of going directly to the reader, and yes. we're, we're, able to, we're able to make a living doing mid-list sort of numbers, uh, and that's, that's true for a lot of authors. Yeah. And so I think this you're gonna is find, one more way to add to it. Yeah, and I, and I think that just like musicians have with like the emergence of the house show circuit or even the online performance platforms that have come up that are amazing, things like Concert Window or Stage It for, for musicians where you can play a concert from your living room, sell tickets to people all over the world, um, you know, even if you're not touring or whatever, and I can imagine, but see, none of that existed just a few years ago, and it's, and it's actually a result of the fertile ground created by the disruption itself, so I think that you're going to continue to find that, like crazy weird things like, whoa, here's this other amazing way that an author can monetize an audience. Um, uh, without a publisher and like things we maybe can't even imagine right now, uh, I think you're gonna it, it, uh, those those opportunities and platforms and businesses are gonna actually come are gonna be like the little flowers that that grow up out of the cracks. Um, that's what we're gonna be. You're gonna see increasingly. Um, weird, crazy, awesome ways for authors to make a living. Yeah. yeah, I definitely think we need to keep our eyes open for new ways to connect with readers because you know. Every, like you said, everything changes. And, you know, right now, uh, the, the booksellers, uh, you know, th there's one way of being discovered, but it, it's going to change, and there will be other ways to be discovered, and, and you should get out. And when know, that happens, that. You, you need to be ready. You need to have tunnels already dug uh, under Amazon, under Apple, under everybody, and have a direct line 
to your tribe. Like you, like that, you need to be making that investment right now. So I, I have a technical question. Uh, when, when, when you get the, uh, when you get the data, when, when you do this, and you get your email numbers, I, I know, uh, I know there's some, there's some issues like with, uh, you know. The, the I can spam thing, like you just don't want to just sign a bunch of people up. Is there some is there some best method of doing this? Like when you get all the when you get all the email subscribers from you guys, yes. and, and then you want to put it into your email thing. Do you, do you put like another opt in thing just to make sure that's all good? What's the best? Yeah, and, and to step back one more step, of, like leading into Dave's question, I was actually going to ask this. Like since it, you know we've been through this, at least Dave has, Dave and Sean at, at CI. What does that process look like? Like, do you, do, do you send, I mean, just explain to people, do, do you send a, a list that they're importing into their email program? Like, how does that work? Yes. So, um, so once you've had some, some folks who've downloaded your content, you have your, um, uh, you know, an audience built up there, um, essentially what you do is, so just so I've said it, because I don't think I, I did, um, so, you know, Noise Trade is completely free. It's free for everybody. So it's free to sign up, free to distribute all your content. The only way, place we take any money is we do allow um, fans to tip uh, if they would like for content. And um, We've we, actually gotten tips, which yeah, is awesome. okay. a surprise. And, um, and, and we, and, and we and get, what, 80%, 80 right? Is that, we, is that right? We, we keep 20% of, uh, of the tips. Yeah, and so, so 80% um, goes directly to the content creators. Um, and that's just for us, so we can cover some very kind of basic operational things that we that we have to pay for. And then, so um, so essentially, what you do is you log into your account, and it'll show you um, a report of here's how many downloads you've had, here's how much tips you've received. Um, it lays it all out for you in various graphs that you can then look at different ways and by time and by uh, and and, um, and then it shows you a uh, a Google uh, geo targeted kind of heat map of Here's the regions where you've had some real activity, like real concentrations where you kind of see. Just gives you an idea, you know, of kind of where your your fans and readers are, and then um, and we'll kind of generate that report for you by month of here's how many you gave away, uh, how many tips you've received, how much, so that you can kind of look back and say, oh, like that one month I I I maybe did a Facebook ad or I I, I did this or got a little feature on that blog and that that drove it up that month. I can see that's good. That means that was something I need to do again or whatever, but. And then essentially, what you do is you just you literally uh, click a uh, a button there, and it just drops for you a CSV of all your data, um, and that is yours. I mean, that it belongs to you. So you can grab it as often as you want to back it up. Um, it will stay on our servers for you. Um, and as folks are downloading your content, um, we uh, we've worked really hard um, on our uh, uh, terms and conditions, our privacy policy to make it very clear with people exactly what's happening and we do message it with a link to all that but we message it really clearly as people are downloading to say you know if you're downloading this content you are agreeing to receive you know to, to be on this email list and receive updates from this author um, and but but you know the thing that's interesting about because um, we have been through some episodes with MailChimp and some of our partners on the email side and um, and the first time you hit your list what's different about us is a lot of people are really taking a chance and they're, and, and you're they're connecting with you kind of sight unseen like they're taking a, a chance um, based on what they've read about you what they can sample what their friends are recommending um, they think they're gonna love it and they give their data and then um, that's what uh, you know gets them their content they're on your list but that first send you know you are you, you, in, in all likelihood you're gonna see um, you know an ups, you know, a, a little, a little. Um, uh, uh, there's going to be a, like some unsubscribes, you know, maybe more than you might see on a typical email because a lot of people um, are taking a chance, you know, like they're, they're, they don't know for sure. By the time you you reach them out, reach out to them in an email, they've read your work, they've experienced it, they've lived with it, and maybe they turn out to be a really big fan and they're stoked. Maybe they turn out not to be a super big fan and they might unsubscribe. Um, but uh, we're different in that way that it's it, this is a discovery opportunity when the data is exchanged, um, and so that very that first one you might see some unsubscribes. But um, and if you want, you could choose to initially do a, a, another opt-in. You could take your list. I don't think that's a bad practice to take your list, put it into whatever email client you're using. Be that somebody like Fanbridge, which we're huge fans of. They they got a great product, or somebody like Mailchimp or Emma or somebody else. Um, you you uh, you, Im you import it there, 
maybe you do uh, an initial second opt-in email um, and you say, hey, thanks so much for joining my list. Here's why you're receiving this. Um, just to make sure everyone's cool, like click here to opt in and do that double. I actually uh, like that better because you're... Yeah. Well, and we said we want you wanted to prune. You wanted a smaller, yeah. more narrow list. Yeah, and, and, and obviously you don't want people on your list... Uh, who don't want to be on it. I mean, you know, no. as I said before, it's like when you give away content and people don't like it, it's a zero opportunity cost, but you also, um, you know, you're looking for your fans. You're looking for right. your... You don't want to annoy anybody. You want no, you people don't. who are most inclined to like your work that's on right. your list so that you can talk to them. That's right, that's right. And, and so that'll be fertile ground for you to build something and build a career. Now, they've already shown intent. They've already said, you know, yes, I give you permission. Yes, here's my data. Yes, I understand. I'm going to be on your list. But if you choose to do that double opt-in, I don't think that's a bad practice at all. Um, but we are we are more than complying um, with those requirements for you to immediately interact with those people. I think if you're going to do it that way, I think what you want to do is your first email needs to require nothing of them and ask nothing of them. I think your first email needs to be pretty quick after um, within within you know days or weeks. You don't want to wait months for your first interaction. But and, and it shouldn't be like a Hey, awesome! Here's eight ways to pay me. Um, I think it should be, hey, mm -hmm. thanks. I hope you love it. Um, and maybe here's a blog that I wrote with my story of how I got into writing, and just to learn a little more about me. You know, kind of like cement the relationship a little bit, and then wait a little bit before you. Um, and if you've already got people on a list, yeah, man, if they're already understanding, definitely you got things to promote, promote, convert them, try to get them to pay you. That's fine. But you want to like ease people in who are coming in by way of something like noise trade and, and bond with them a little bit first. Um, just, just a thanks, you know. So th um, this, has been, this has been really, really great. So what's the best way for everybody to get started, Derek? You think yes. uh, just go to noisetrade.com and, and start uploading your books, right? Exactly. So go to noisetrade.com. Um, up in the right corner, there's going to be a place that's really clearly to kind of sign up for the first time. It takes a few minutes. Um, so, you know, sign up and then start uploading your content, um, and uh, you know, you could be live on the site within minutes, and uh, and start building your uh, start building your tribe. All right, well, that sounds great. Um, thanks so much for being on, Derek. Please stick around until we um, close up the show. But for everybody sure. else, um, thanks for joining us. And uh, just a reminder to for 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 our call to action is smart uh, the Smarter Artist Summit. Just remember that. Uh, there's only 150 tickets. Attendance is limited. So smarterartistsummit.com if you want to join us in, in Austin, Texas. Texas. Austin, Texas for two days with um, with our seven speakers plus guests plus us. Um, smarterartistsummit.com. And so thanks, everybody, for listening to the self-publishing podcast. And we will see y'all next week. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure.